Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Paige, and you are here for our first time homebuyers webinar. I am joined by Sean Dunn, Senior Mortgage Specialist with Directors Mortgage. And without further ado, our presenter tonight is Sean Dunn. Beginning his career in the mortgage industry in 2013, Sean understands the significance that a home purchase has to his clients. Providing you with the smoothest process, outstanding customer service, and various loan product options are key components to his business. Sean's number one priority is clear communication and making sure all of his clients understand the options, process, and decisions being made. Today, Sean is proud to be part of the Director's Mortgage Team, the largest privately owned mortgage company throughout Oregon and Washington. Director's Mortgage is built upon three principles take care of our clients, our team members, and our community. Sean is licensed to work in California, Oregon, and Washington. So please join me in welcoming Sean. We're so grateful you're here tonight, all Thanks. of you. Uh, Sean, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Paige. I, uh, there's nothing more 2020, I was telling Paige when we logged on, than taking a Zoom call, uh, sitting in your camper trailer outside. My uh, two-year-old's getting ready to go to bed, so didn't want to disturb her working from home tonight and thought this would be the smartest choice. So without further ado, we will switch over to the PowerPoint here. I created this um, over the last uh, few weeks and realized that I never put an introduction slide in. So I uh, put this together kind of last minute, thought I'd introduce myself briefly. Um, Paige did a great job there. Uh, going on seven years uh, as a loan officer, all with Director's Mortgage. Uh, a company that I really uh, have enjoyed working at and appreciate um, what they do for the community. Uh, this year in 2020, uh, I helped 147 families. I just ran the calculation um, now being the first week of January. So I was super excited about that, um, either with the purchase of a home or, or a refi. Um, myself personally, I love playing golf. Have to throw that in there. Um, and uh, I am licensed in Oregon, Washington and California, like she mentioned. I actually just added Idaho today and, um, and then uh, adding Arizona next week. So uh, today we are looking at, are you ready to uh, buy? So one of the first things, one of the most important things, uh, really, I, I kind of say it um, and with hopefully not a grain of salt, really just one of the most important things in our culture um, is your credit score. People are often surprised to hear uh, that it dictates more um, than just your interest rate on a loan or a car. Uh, it can factor into what they charge you for homeowner's insurance. Um, it can factor into, of course, whether or not you get credit cards, what those rates are, um, down to whether or not the water company wants a deposit from you when you move, or if they just turn on service. It's super, super important. Um, so let's start by just doing a little bit of um, investigating on what credit score is and, and how it's calculated. So one of the biggest keys uh, to credit score that I think people often um, kind of, it kind of catches them a bit by surprise is that you have to use credit uh, in order to have a good score. And what I mean by that is paying off all your debt, if you have it, or just never opening cards um, because you're a very you know, conservative, cautious person, unfortunately, is not the way to get a great credit score. Um, really, the algorithms want to see that you, that you do have debt or that you do have credit lines open and that you use them in a, in a good um, and educated way. So one of the biggest keys to that is on, uh, on revolving accounts, credit cards, things like that. You really never want to use more than 30% of your outs of your available limit. And I say that I don't even know what the available limit is on every single credit card of mine. But if you're looking at building up your credit, that's really step one, go look at what your your maximum limit is on each credit card. Now, what that number is, isn't really that important as much as not using more than 30% of it is. So if it's $1,000, never use more than 300 on that card. Uh, and then, of course, up or down from there, depending on what the uh, the limit is. So that's on revolving accounts. And then, uh, you know, sometimes I'll see someone working on building up the credit a lot and they will pay off a car or they'll finish paying off a student loan. Uh, and actually, in the short term, they might see their credit score go down a few points, which would seem backwards. But 
they were really getting a positive credit history, a, you know, a positive mark every month they made that payment. Um, not to say you should have a car loan if you don't need one, but it just goes to show that having credit and making those on-time payments is important. Uh, this pie chart is great. Uh, amounts owed in the green, that's that 30% uh, limit uh, that I was referring to. Uh, payment history, of course, is the biggest chunk. So if you don't miss payments, if you make on-time payments, um, that's huge. Uh, limiting the amount of inquiries and new credit lines you have, um, as well as having a mix of credit cards and you know loans, like car loans, that's important. Those are the top two there. And then credit history, that's the one that is a little bit out of your control. Um, you know, if you're a younger person just trying to buy a house, um, you just don't have 30 years of credit history because you're 25. So um, just keep making, you know, on-time payments and and sort of, I, unfortunately, I chalk it up to playing the game, you know, get, get some credit cards open, get them active. Um, don't let, you know, if you have a really old credit card, don't let um, that one get closed on you automatically. That's something else I see. So if your parents got you a card when you got, you know, uh, your first uh, temp permit so you could buy gas or something, um, be sure that card stays open even if you're not using it anymore. Uh, so, you know, credit is, it's a, I, it's a fickle beast. Uh, it's, a, a, of course, a massive uh, driver in, in the mortgage industry, just as well as a lot of other things. So uh, I love helping people with credit and, and just talking through scenarios and um, do's and don'ts and things they can do um, to work up on that. So um, and, and any lender, really, we see a lot of credit reports. So, um, so don't hesitate to reach out if you don't think you're there yet. Um, because knowledge is power. So sometimes we can help you build a good, you know, three, six, nine month strategy uh, to improving that score. So the next few slides, uh, we've got credit, we're working on it, uh, or it's there. Um, so, you know, what, what are your, what are your kind of general um, budgeting plans? So uh, step one, of course, is just roof over your head, uh, prioritize bills, uh, make sure that the, you know, your cards are set on auto pay to the minimum so of course you wanna be paying more than that if you're working on paying off debt, but you can still set it so that it pays the minimum every month uh, so that you just make sure you never accidentally miss a payment or anything like that um, as you're working on building up credit. And then uh, two from there, once, you're, once your bills are paid, once you've got kind of things on auto, then you wanna track your spending, uh, make sure you're understanding what is going out the door, um, how many of those subscriptions are necessary or um, or hindering you from saving to buy a house. Um, you know, doing these two things will allow you to, to really manage. And I say dealing with debt, um, really it's managing debt because again, um, it's, it's not bad to have a car loan. You know, you don't, you, you don't, you may not have to wait to pay off that car to improve your credit. It'd be actually helping you. Um, so just once you've got bills and budgeting going, um, you're really managing um, that a lot debt a lot better, excuse me. Uh, one, um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is you can go on um, annualcreditreport.com right there. Uh, and each of the bureaus has to give you a free copy of your credit report every year. Uh, so if you don't have any idea where you stand, um, you can go get all three. Um, I like to just get one of mine, you know, every four months, uh, I'll just go get TransUnion one month. And then four months later, I'll go get Experian. And for me, it's just sort of credit monitoring. Uh, make sure there's no um, no one bought a Tesla I don't know about that I don't have the keys to uh, kind of thing, especially with 2021 and, and just technology going the way it is. Um, here's uh, a bit of a list of do's and don'ts. Really, I think what I often boil it down to, and I a bit said it earlier, is just knowledge is power. Um, credit is uh, so scenario driven so case by case um, person to person um, that it's really tough to have um, just a big general list so um, as you're prepping uh, for a home purchase i always advise talk to a lender asap because you know even if you're not going to buy for a year i absolutely that's my favorite time to talk to a client because um, we can set up a really good year-long goal check in along the way um, and then make the optimal buying experience happen versus, hey, I found my dream house. I'm ready to go. I don't know where my credit score is at. How much do I need for a down? I don't remember. And then just trying to put it all together and sort of scrambling. So having a plan, um, it's something that's so easy to plan. Um, and meeting with lenders is should be totally free. Uh, we love to help plan. 
um, you know, do things um, that seem obvious, but we see we see it happen all the time. Uh, people will be ready to buy a house and then, oh, yeah, I co-signed on my brother's car. I just thought it would help them out, but I didn't know it would show on my credit report. Um, so you want to, uh, of course, avoid things like that that seem kind of obvious, but we, we see it pretty often. Um, when it comes to, you know, if you do have some old collections, um, there's some definite strategies uh, to paying them off or not paying them off. Um, so, for example, one of my biggest uh, tips is that medical collections on a credit report are tagged as medical. And in the mortgage world, we, we have the full authority to ignore them. So you can have a $5,000 medical collection from a car accident and, you know, the insurance didn't cover it and things that are just out of your control. In the mortgage industry, we have been given permission to, to look at those medical tag uh, collections and items and understand that those are, those are you know, those are situational uh, and, and we're medical. Um, so paying off, you know, if you have $5,000 to work with, paying off a $2,500 medical collection may not be the strategy that gets you um, to owning a home. Um, now, is it something you want to pay off in the future? Yeah, maybe we could talk about that, but is it the, the strategy to get you into home ownership quickest? Probably not. There's probably a better way to allocate that $2,500. Um, so really a lot of this is just, I kind of boil it down to don't, don't really do or don't anything until you chat with a lender and kind of have a, a good strategy there. Um, so that's a little bit of a credit portion. Um, I think it went maybe a little faster than I expected it to. So I won't be totally surprised if there's not any questions at this point. Um, if so, I'm easily interrupted Paige, so don't hesitate, but uh, we will keep uh, trucking along real quick. Um, so I had that um, all set up. Uh, you know, credit is just, it just is a big step one because it, it does drive everything. So now, we can kind of transition a little bit more into um, types of loans, down payments, minimum credit scores, really a, a lot more detail on the home buying side. But um, sometimes I just forget that, you know, credit is just such a big step one that can take years to, to fix or create or anything like that. So really wanted to set that whole thing up as a starter. So uh, what are types of loans? Um, there is conventional. That's the one you might hear a lot of. It's definitely the most popular. Um, conventional, you know, that's that's your fixed, uh, your your classic sort of fixed rate, thirty year. Uh, typically, on a conventional loan, we like to see um, about a seven hundred plus credit score. Uh, I'll dive into a bit more detail on all of these in a, in, a, in the coming slides. Minimum down payments three percent. Then the second bucket you have is government loans. Um, these are VA. USDA and FHA. So VA, that's the pretty straightforward one. Veterans, um, <clears throat> of course, got to take a step back at this point, and just say, you know, veterans, thank you for your service. Um, because of that, you have a better loan than I'll ever be able to have. There really is no beating a VA loan. You've earned it, you deserve it, uh, so use it. So I always, I always put my same plug in at this point in any presentation, which is if you know a veteran that doesn't own a home, they should. Um, and we should help them. So we should help them get into this loan. Uh, the biggest, uh, there's so many perks, but one of the biggest perks is it's 100% financing. Uh, there's no mortgage insurance, um, great rates. I mean, it's just a good, it's a good loan. So um, uh, USDA uh, in Deschutes County, uh, USDA is exactly what you'd think. It's the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, I know, what are they doing in, in the lending business? Uh, it's a great follow-up question to that. Um, USDA loan um, is is really meant to encourage um, growth and, and stimulate economies in rural um, towns. So really think anything not Bend for our part of uh, for our part of the world. Anything outside of Bend, so Redmond, Prineville, Lapine, Madras, um, Sisters, all of those places, um, you can use a USDA loan. It's 100% financing. That's their big perk. That's their big. Um, encouragement to use that loan product. Uh, we'll go into some other details in a moment. Uh, and then FHA. FHAs, uh, often you'll hear people refer to that as a really common first time home buyer loan. It's the Federal Housing Administration. Uh, there's no requirement to be a first time home buyer, uh, but the reason it ends up uh, having a lot of first time home buyer use is it's just a very, very flexible loan. Um, so again, we'll dive into that in a bit. And then lastly, just while we're talking about it, there are other loans. 
um, jumbo loans. I don't think unless you're a different first time home buyer than I was um, a few years ago, you're not about to go buy an $800,000 house. So not very uh, applicable, but that is for, um, for the upper end loans. Second mortgage is HELOC. Construction is one that, that you know, people ask a lot about. Um, construction is inherently still pretty difficult to do. Um, it's a risky loan. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, so you, you might often see lenders that want higher down payments, more skin in the game, um, different funky ways of structuring it. It's, it's very, very tough, I, I would say, as a first time home buyer to try um, to go down some sort of construction route. Um, portfolio is kind of unique things, private money, same, um, house flipping, things like that. But those are just some other loan options. Uh, so a little bit more detail about conventional loans. Um, and just so you know, I have, I will say uh, a decent amount more than is on this slide. So if um, anyone's taking notes, um, that's just a note. Uh, so the conventional loan limit uh, for 2021 is 548,000 to 50. Um, that's the maximum loan that a conventional loan can be. Um, if you if you hear the terms Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, those are kind of buzzwords. Those are those are conventional loans um, and the guidelines that they follow. The absolute minimum credit score for a conventional loan is 620. Uh, you'll you'll be now you might say, hey, on the last slide you said 700 plus. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that is an a a, a bottom. You can't be lower than 620. However, if you're between like the 620 and the 700 um, mark, it probably would make more sense to go with an FHA loan. Uh, and, a, and a lender should show you the pros and cons to both loan options because you might qualify for both. Um, and more often than not, uh, on an FHA loan, if you have a 640 credit score, you're going to get a significantly better interest rate than a conventional loan significantly lower mortgage insurance. Um, so although it is a minimum of 620, you really don't typically see people start to use it until they're around that 700 mark. Uh, any loan that doesn't have that magic 20% down number, that's where, you know, that, that one we all hear, um, is going to have some sort of MI. Uh, I always, I really, really want to emphasize, don't let MI stop you from buying a house. Rather use it as a tool to allow you to build equity. Um, you know, MI is a, is a part, it's, a, it's sort of just a part of the, the game. So if the mortgage, income, mortgage insurance company is basically saying, if you pay us just a little bit on, you know, as a part of your payment, then we will let you buy this house with, you know, we'll let you buy this $300,000 house with 9,000 down, let's just say 3%. Um, that is awesome versus trying to save up $50,000 just to avoid some PMI. Um, I know I am a terrible saver. So to save up 50, I'd still be spinning my tires. Rather, if you buy that house with 9,000 down, you know, maybe you get a good tax refund, you've been saving a little and you put it together, you get that 3% down. Now you own a home, you're, uh, you're gaining the appreciation that you're seeing in the Bend and Central Oregon market. You are a part of of that, you're, you're, you know, you're, you have forced savings by the fact that that three hundred thousand dollar house is worth three twenty the next year. So you just made twenty thousand rather than just still sitting on the sideline trying to wait and save up money. Uh, so really, uh, PMI over the last five, six, seven years has really gone down quite a bit. It's become a, a more competitive in, environment, and the companies are um, having to compete. And so uh, that's a benefit to you. Um, really, really, I just say it. I want to say it again, don't wait to have 20% down to buy a house. Um, I'd say that uh, you, I, more often than not, people are very surprised at um, how affordable uh, mortgage insurance is and, and you don't even notice. I've honestly had it on every single loan I've had um, in one, two, three is my fourth house. And um, I've had it on all of them as I work towards gaining more and more equity each time I, I sell and buy. Uh, down payments. Oftentimes people ask me, what's a perk of being a first time home buyer? Uh, one of the biggest ones is on a conventional loan, the minimum down payment is 3%. Uh, for anyone else, after you've owned a home, it's 5%. Um, so that's a perk for being a first time home buyer. Uh, and then really it goes in, um, it goes in buckets. So 3%, 5%, 10, 15, and 20. Those are, there's really no great reason to do 
anything other than those sort of even percentages. Um, and then real quickly, uh, I like to um, sort of empower people to get a bit of an idea um, of what you might qualify or what do we look at when we say, and this is totally off this chart. So if you're taking notes, you have to write this down. Um, what do we look at when we say, what, do you, what can you afford? So uh, what we look at is called debt to income ratio. So step one, look at your gross monthly income. Uh, let's say your salary, just for the sake of making it nice, easy numbers. Um, not that you'll have a mortgage this low, but let's say your gross salary is $4,000 a month. Uh, and again, gross is what we look at in my industry. So your gross salary is 4,000 a month and the mortgage payment's gonna be 1,000. Gave myself a nice softball one. Um, that's 25% of your income. And that's the first thing we look at. What percent of your gross income is the mortgage payment going to be? Um, anything in the 30s, 20s, uh, you can squeak into the low 40s um, is where you want to be there. Ideally in the 30s or 20s um, is a good number. Number two is the real important one. So take um, take the $1,000 that the mortgage payment is going to be. Uh, let's say you have a $500 car loan. $250 student loan payment and 250 in credit card minimum payments. So um, on your credit report, um, you have another thousand dollars between the car, the credit cards and the student loans. So once we add the thousand dollar mortgage, your total credit liability, and we, we only look at what's on a credit report. We don't look at bills or trash can service or Netflix, nothing like that. So only what's on your credit report is uh, what's important, your total debt out the door every month is going to be two thousand. That'd be fifty percent of your income, of course, and that is the maximum amount that we can look at for a conventional loan. So most conventional loans, there are certain cases where it can be a little more strict, but most can go up to forty nine point nine percent of your income, uh, and then not a really a penny more. Uh, so that's what we look at: um, total debt to income ratio, conventional loan, no more than fifty percent. And that's that, you know, that's the max. So really we'd we'd like to see it a little bit lower than that. Hi, Sean. Uh, yeah. Before we continue on, do you mind taking a couple of questions? That's perfect. Let's do it. Okay. So first let's go back to that last slide if you could. It says here, um, loans over 80% loan to value require private mortgage mortgage insurance. And we had a question, after paying off 20% of your loan, do you stop paying private mortgage insurance? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, that is actually a great perk of a conventional loan that you will not see on an FHA loan. So on a conventional loan, um, if you put 5% down and you just stay in this house for the foreseeable future, um, there's two ways that this can happen. So one, if you reach 20% equity in your home, based on what you bought it for, which often should happen in you know seven or, or so years if you put kind of a minimum down, um, then it will it legally has to drop off. So a conventional loan, when you reach 20% equity based on the purchase price, it goes away. Uh, so that's option one. Um, however, uh, and, and actually caveat, it's 22% equity if you just wait, but um, I, I, I really couldn't tell you why that is actually, uh, just two extra percent if you wait, but it does go away. The beauty of that right now and why that's so important is that if you buy a house today and your rate is 2.75 or something crazy low like rates are, uh, or even if you buy a house just in the next year, rates are not projected to go up, um, then we should, uh, you, won't, you may not want to refi in the future if rates are higher. So on this loan, um, you won't have to refi, you can just wait and the mortgage insurance will drop off. Um, option number two, and a bit more common, is your house that you bought for 300 is now worth 375 in just two years because hashtag Central Oregon. And uh, you, based on your balance, you now have 20% equity based on market value. And if you have it based on market value, then you can request from your loan servicer that they remove it, uh, typically a phone call or a letter um, and then almost every time the loan servicer will say, prove it, and you can pay, you know, four or $500. I've seen it as low as $200, something like that. 
um, to get sort of a, a mini appraisal, uh, and then they'll remove it. Um, so that's the more common way if you want it based on the market value. But a couple hundred dollars is a heck of a lot cheaper than a full refi, uh, a refinance, especially if you have a really good rate and you don't want to lose it. So that is a perk to conventional. You can get rid of it in the future. Thank you. A couple other questions. How negative is a bankruptcy in mortgage lending decisions? Great. So uh, not the end of the world by any means. Um, that's one of the areas where um, FHA is a little more flexible than conventional um, as well. And you'll kind of keep hearing that as a theme. Um, so depending on the type of bankruptcy, um, the, the two main ones being a seven or a 13, um, there might be a certain amount of waiting time before you can buy. So um, on a chapter and each loan product has a different wait time as well. So um, I have a cheat sheet on my desk that I can go look at that has all of those because you can jumble them pretty quickly. But basically uh, between FHA, USDA, conventional, it's gonna be somewhere between two and four years uh, from the date that the bankruptcy was discharged. That's an important time, uh, an important thing to know is when was your bankruptcy discharged? And then uh, off, I think for, unless these rules and you know rules can always change, but pretty, uh, it's, it's held pretty steady that about two years is the quickest after a bankruptcy. Uh, and then with the, with the, the longest wait period being about four. Uh, but again, that's going to depend on the type of bankruptcy uh, and maybe a few other factors. But it's not the seven. A lot of people have that seven year mark. That's more to do with when things start to fall off your credit report. So we can see it and you can still get a loan um, depending on that two to four year window. Good clarification. All right, last question uh, for the moment. How difficult is it to obtain a mortgage if one spouse is disabled and unable to generate a stable income besides their monthly disability slash social security insurance payment or um, a single income earner? Yeah, so um, we can use, and it's and we often do, um, disability um and Social Security are absolutely usable sources of income in the mortgage world. Um, so we can look at what those payments add up to be. Um, just as a side note, while we're talking about it, child support and alimony, um, those things can be used, again, a little bit case by case, but pretty commonly can be used as qualifying income. Um, so you, you, don't have to, um, you don't have to have a traditional job and, um, and you know, be a W-2 earner if you have an income source and it's fixed and pretty predictable like social security and disability are, um, then we can look at using those. Um, and then as uh, a single earner, uh, you know, in the, whether there's one, two, three or four people on a loan, uh, it always just comes down to that debt to income ratio that really drives everything. So um, if you have one person, then it's, you know, a pretty quick calculation. If you have two, um, then it, I kind of call it a blender, you know, so boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, just two people buying a house, whatever the case may be. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be all their debt into a blender, all their income, and then one mixed debt to income ratio. Um, an asterisk, uh, to that is the most common reason for a cosigner in the mortgage world would be to help someone's debt to income ratio. Uh, so, for example, when I first bought my house, um, the mortgage world didn't see kindly upon a por the fact that I was new in an industry that had some commission and bonus and things like that. So I was making more money and I knew I could afford a house, but on paper, because of the mortgage rules, my debt to income ratio wasn't strong enough. Um, my credit was fine. I had three and a half percent down. Um, so my dad co-signed me, co-signed for me to buy my first house. Um, because his debt to income was very low. Um, and so it helped offset mine. Um, so a cosigner is an option in the mortgage world. And the number one reason for one um, is to help someone, um, you know, if you have a 60% debt to income ratio and it's just not working and you have a parent or someone in your life, grandparent that can co-sign and they have a very low debt to income ratio, then that can help fix that um, issue. Fantastic. Thank you for answering those questions. Yeah, certainly. So we're comparing a lot um, conventional to 
uh, and then let's go to the other three quickly, our government loans. Um, these four conventional and these three, I mean, these are by a long shot, you know, these, the four of these loans probably make up 98% of all home loans. So really outside of this, you don't, you don't see many more. So conventionals, um, the big one, and then here's three uh, government options. So um, FHA is your, definitely your most common. Like I said earlier, it's often um, mentioned as a first time home buyer, but you don't have to be. It's just that it's more flexible. Um, you can go with credit scores down to um, right now for a lot of lenders because of COVID, I hate even using the word now still, but uh, because it still exists, um, that minimum credit score has kind of crept up a little. So you're seeing a lot of lenders that are putting that number at 620 um, or some have even gotten more conservative at, at 640 or so. Uh, but for most of my career prior to March of this last year, uh, FHA has been able to go down pretty consistently to about 580. Um, once you're below 580, um, you may hear of lenders saying they can give you loans, but my advice there is, it will be not a great loan. <laughs> and it might be worth taking some time just to build up your credit a little uh, and then save money in the long run by getting a, a better loan option. So, uh, but really FHA, I, I, I see again in the near future, the minimum credit score being about 580. Uh, 620 is a, is a really good target though to get you a better interest rate and things like that. Um, FHA's minimum down payment is three and a half percent. There's really no reason you'd be using an FHA loan and putting more than that down. Um, so that's your target there, three and a half percent. FHA has a version of mortgage insurance. It's the same for everyone. So it's not credit score driven, uh, which again, really helps keep the payments low. Um, and even if you have a 640, you're going to get a better rate on FHA than you are on conventional. So because it's the Federal Housing Administration, they're able to give um, some perks and and do those loans and those kind of mid or middle low credit scores. Um, uh, that was a thanks whoever asked that first question because a big sort of caveat to FHA is it is not your forever loan is what I tell people. It is a 30 year fixed loan, <clears throat> but it is not one you wanna keep for 30 years. It has mortgage insurance uh, forever. There's no way you can get rid of it. Um, so you do have to refinance. So um, I bought my first house FHA I sold that one. I bought another house and I still used FHA a second time. It was the better option for me. And then I wanted to keep that house as a rental. So I refinanced that house into conventional because I wanted to get rid of my them, I and everything. And now I keep that conventional loan forever. So it's really a, a piece of the puzzle. It's not your forever loan. Um, and then I moved kind of over into the conventional loan bucket from there moving forward. Um, and then another way they're more flexible uh, is FHA's debt to income ratio, that number, that magic number that drives everything is 56% or so. You know, they, they, they take a few more things into consideration, but um, it is definitely, can be more flexible. It's definitely a little higher. Um, one thing I just thought of that I, uh, I don't think I put myself any notes in here is, and it's pretty common is student loans. Um, they exist. Unfortunately, a lot of us have um, some and a lot of us have a lot. Um, one thing with student loans um, is that every loan product will look at those a little different as well. Um, it's best, uh, generally speaking, if you can be in repayment on a student loan um, and have that payment showing on your credit report. More often than not, we can look at using that credit report payment. Um, FHA, one sort of bug that they have is that if, if you're in deferment or if you have income-based repayments that are really low, they kind of make us use a, a pseudo payment of 1% of the balance. Um, so student loans can kind of be a bit finicky. Uh, it's another good reason if you have some student loans to um, chat with a lender about what loan you might be prepping to use in the future. And then that gives you some time to set up your student loans in a way that's gonna be most beneficial uh, for you. So if student loans, just put an asterisk by that as um, something you want to chat with. If you're, you know, if you're game planning, um, maybe to chat with the lender and just say, I also have some student loans. Here's the status. Here's the balance. You know, what would be, what's going to be most advantageous for me? Uh, again, great loan, more flexible than conventional, often used first time home buyer. 
uh, three and a half percent down. Uh, VA, uh, I kind of mentioned that one a little uh, earlier. It's, it's really the best loan out there. You, it can't be beat, um, which is the idea. It's 100 percent financing, uh, no down payment required. No, again, no real great reason you'd put one down um, if you didn't have to. There's no mortgage insurance at all, even if you put no money down. Um, the interest rates are, are typically good. Um, credit scores are in line with FHAs. So, you you know, most lenders right now really want to see that 620 um, plus. Uh, typically speaking, you can go, the, the VA doesn't technically have a minimum credit score, but it's pretty hard to find a lender willing to do one much below 580. Um, so although if you just Google it, you might see some some um, content that says they don't have one. Um, that may be true. However, lender to lender, um, you may you may struggle to find someone willing to do one much below 580. So it's definitely doable. Uh, it's very if you're in that 500 credit score category and you're trying to use a VA loan, it can be very case by case based on your credit um, report. You know what's on there and why is it where it is. So um, let's see there. Uh, debt to income ratio is uh, it's pretty flexible, much like FHAs. Um, they have a bit of a unique calculation that they do um, that's unique to the VA, um, way more complicated than we would get into now. Uh, but they have sort of a unique way of looking at it. They say, you know, if this is your net paycheck and here's some of your bills. So they're going to get they're going to look into into it a little more detailed than other loans um, will. Uh, but that's one of the reasons for that is because you're putting 100% down. So they're going to be a little more, um, they're going to look into it a little deeper than uh, than the other two might. Uh, and then lastly, uh, USDA, Department of Agriculture, um, reminder, or if anyone was late, um, that's in, in our part of the world, that's anything not in Bend, basically. It's not just the true city lines. Um, USDA has a, a map of their own, but that's a good good tool to look at. It's basically not in Bend. Um, the beauty of USDA is if you're not a veteran, then this is your 100% financing option. So no down payment required. Um, anyone can use this loan. Um, it, you have to you know, look, live in Madras, Prineville, Redmond, something like that. Um, it's a great, really great loan. Rates are gonna be good. Again, anytime the government's backing it, that definitely helps keep rates low. Uh, they have like a, a version of mortgage insurance. It's just, um, it's pretty cheap. It's actually a little less than half of FHAs. Um, so it does exist, but um, it's, it's really uh, much more affordable. Um, so it doesn't hurt too much in the payment. And the biggest kicker with USDA is they have an income limit. So um, USDA actually won't let you use their product if you make too much money. Um, and uh, that's just been how they've operated um, since I've ever known. So um, the income limit can be based on family size um, and where you live. So it's it's a county income limit. Um, so if you're in, you know, Crook or Jefferson, it might be different than if you're in Deschutes um, and then, of course, anywhere else. So um, you can look up count the, the limits on your own or um, it's probably easier if you just reach out to a lender. Um, we know all the, the quickest ways to do it. Um, typically, family one to four. Um, it's not it's not too strict. In most counties, it's going to be right around 100,000 um, total income, total household income. Uh, so I don't want to get too much into the weeds or discourage anyone from looking into that, but just something to note, they do have an income limit that uh, a lender is going to look at, make sure you're under the income limit. And then on uh, debt to income ratio, that magic thing again, um, USDA, because uh, it's 100% financing and you're not a veteran, so you don't fit that bucket. It is the most strict. So typically speaking, they won't let your total debt to income ratio be more than 44%. So if you remember, FHA is 56, conventional is mostly 50, USDA is a decent amount more strict at 44. Um, but if you're under the income limit and you qualify for the home that you want in Lapine, um, then this, there's no reason you would, there's re really no reason you'd go another way. Um, USDA is a really, really great loan if you fit those options. If a down payment just continues to be your hurdle between renting and buying, then um, USDA is a great loan option to look into. 
Hey, Sean. Yes. There's a question that came up uh, directly in relation to something that you mentioned before. Uh, you mentioned how an FHA loan is not your forever loan. And you mentioned how you could go about transitioning that loan, refinancing it to a conventional. The question that we've gotten is what qualifications do you need to have in order to refinance an FHA loan to a conventional? Good question. And just refinancing in general. So um, uh, a refinance is completely paying off the old loan and completely starting a new loan. So um, it's always kind of funny. I kind of laugh every time I think about it, but in a refi, um, the fact that you have for however many years you've had that loan, the fact that you've made those payments um, is nice, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, what we really are going to look at is you as a brand new borrower that day. So um, you, if you have a whole different job, a whole different credit score, everything, you have to essentially re-qualify for the new loan. So ideally, when you're refining, it's it's in a time and a place where you're maybe even lowering your payment um, or you're, you know, you're getting into a shorter term, like you're going from a 30 to a 15 or, you know, something like that. Um, but it is a, it's a whole new loan. So it's another, it's all the gather, all the paperwork, um, all the credit scores. We look at debt to income ratio, you go to underwriting. It's, it's as if you're buying a house, the only difference being you just live in this one, um, but it's a full loan process. So uh, it looks at everything. Um, like we like we would if we were pre-approving someone um, or you were buying a house. Um, you have to fully qualify for the new loan. Um, we pay off the old one and we give you a new one with a new structure. Uh, perfect. So uh, the mortgage process. Now that we have sort of our four main um, loan products, um, there's a thousand times more detail than that, but I think that's hopefully just enough about those loans uh, to be dangerous. So uh, this is ultimately a very boiled down version. And actually it's funny, this graph is uh, a little bit outdated to an extent too. But uh, so the process uh, pre-qualification, um, that, uh, that is a phone call where we're talking about what you make and you know, we're talking about debt. Pre-qualification really um, is just a conversation and a starting point, a game plan, things like that. Maybe we haven't even pulled credit yet. We're just planning. Um, I don't want to um, leave that step out because it's so important. Um, now, between step one and two, maybe there's only a few minutes. You just go online and fill out an application, but maybe there's a year. It's still a step in the process. You know, get on the phone, meet with someone. Uh, and start the ball, you know, start talking about your situation. Um, the mortgage world is a very weird world. You know, are you self-employed? How long have you been self-employed? Do you have bonuses over time? Can we use it? Can't we? There's just a lot of, a lot of rules, um, as you'd imagine. So uh, getting the process started. And then, of course, we're going to go to an application. Um, you're going to fill out uh, all the nuts and bolts of who you are, how long you've worked, where you've worked, things like that. Um, we look at a two-year history for pretty much any loan. We're always going to look at a two-year work history. Um, if, you, if you're, for example, out of school, newer on a job, we can use school to supplement that. But um, And it's not uh, sort of a, a thing I hear a lot. It's not two years at one job. We don't need a two-year steady, consistent history. Uh, it's just a two-year work history. You're absolutely allowed to have changed jobs once or twice or, you know, whatever the case may be in there, but we're going to look at the two-year history. Um, we're look at credit, all the things we went over. Uh, so then we're going to go over the numbers, make sure that um, you're comfortable with your payment, what you're qualified for. Um, I call this the, uh, the HGTV myth, which is uh, you are not ever just pre-approved for a purchase price. Um, I wish it were that easy. Uh, rather, you are actually pre-approved for a payment and we reverse engineer what that payment will likely be in a purchase price. So, um, cause again, debt to income ratio is how much is, how much room is there left for a mortgage payment? So, um, we, uh, will tell you about what purchase price that is, but it should really be a range, you know, 280 to 300, somewhere in there. Um, once you get out and you find a home, it's accepted. Um, at that point is when your loan goes to processing, underwriting, 
in closing. So a really good loan officer is going to have um, done all of the legwork, gathered all the paperwork, made sure if there was any question marks that we got them answered so that when you're out house hunting, you feel very confident that the last three steps will go through um, relatively smoothly. Underwriters may ask for updated paperwork or want a few a bit more information about a job gap or things like that, but um, good loan officers are going to have already sort of prepped you for the things that underwriting is going to ask for. Uh, closing on a home typically takes 30 to 60 days. Um, sometimes it can go a little faster. Um, hopefully it never takes much longer than that. Um, you know, depends on how busy the market is and things like that. But um, from finding your house and getting an accepted offer, pretty standard about 30 to 45 days uh, before closing. Um, I won't dive too much into this one. Um, I've done these classes a few times with real estate agents. Um, so this is one of their slides that I, I sort of left in here. But, um, you know, once you're pre-approved, you know what you can afford, then that's when you're going to get connected with um, a real estate agent. As a buyer, you don't pay the real estate agents. Sellers pay real estate agents. Um, so once you're pre-approved, uh, a lender may have um, a recommendation. Um, you may have a friend or family member, you know, a, fr a friend or family member that has a recommendation. You know, you'll find someone. There's a lot of real estate agents out there. Um, and then they'll start helping you find a house that you like and running numbers with the lender while you're out searching and, and whatnot. But um, definitely cart and horse is an important piece of that puzzle. You want to make sure you are pre-approved and you know exactly what you can afford and what type of loan you're going to use um, because those are all going to be the first questions an agent asks before you really start looking at properties is getting all the financing side squared away and ready to go uh, before you're out shopping. Uh, again, this is from their slide. Um, it's already, let's see, seven, 17. Uh, oh, we got a little more time. Yeah. Uh, so you get accepted. So I will go uh, a little more into detail on this one then. So you're accepted on a home. What are some of the processes um, just from the real estate side of things? Uh, you're going to put an earnest money deposit down. Um, this is important because even if you're using 100% financing or you are getting a gift from a family member, so you don't have the money in your account, when you get an accepted offer, you know, typically one, two, three thousand dollars is going to be required to be deposited up front. Um, so you want to make sure you're prepped for that. Um, if you are putting a down payment down or anything like that, it's really just the first part of your down payment. It's your money. Um, it's just sort of I call it an olive branch to the seller uh, to sort of show, show them that hey, you're taking your house off the market because you've accepted my offer. It's going to take me 30, 40 days to close the loan. In that amount of time, the seller is going to have to make another mortgage payment. Um, so it's just kind of like a putting your money where your mouth is, I guess, for lack of a better term. Uh, it's still your money. You're just putting it in the pot to show that you uh, that you mean business. Uh, at this point, you're going to do home inspections. Uh, make sure that you're not buying a lemon. Home inspections are super, super important. Um, they crawl in the crawl space. They look. They go on the ceiling. You know, they uh, check the chimney. All sorts of stuff. Um, they really, they really go through the house in a lot of detail. Um, and you might do some repair negotiations with the seller um, once that reports in, um, things like that. So that's all a little bit more on the agent side, but um, I definitely wanted to, to mention it. Um, then you get an appraisal. So oftentimes uh, people will say, what's the difference between an inspection and appraisal? Makes a lot of sense. Inspections, um, that's, that's a down and dirty job. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, you guys can make fun of me for this, I suppose, but I'm never going in a crawl space. I can't handle that. It's too gross. Can't do it. And there, that's what that's what a good home inspector is going to do. Make sure everything is totally dialed in. Um, an appraisal could happen in a tuxedo. That guy's not going to, or or gal's not going to, um, by any means, look into the details of the home. Um, they are going to go walk through it, but that's just a, that's a bit of a formality. That's a very high level walk through that they're doing. Um, just to make sure there's not some crazy addition we don't know about or something like that. Um, but really the job of the appraiser is to establish value. Um, so their job is really more at a desk looking, you know, hey, what if, what do three bedroom, two bath houses in Deschutes River Woods sell for these days? Um, and is this one at, at the right price? So they're there to, to help establish a value. 
which a lender of course is gonna want. So inspection is for you. Uh, an inspection, let's say on average is maybe $400-ish. Um, and an appraisal in Deschutes County right now is about 745. Um, totally separate jobs, um, both important. Um, yeah, the last two are a little detailed, but we'll make sure that when you buy this house, it has a clean title. There's no judgments or liens, but yeah, as a lender, we're not gonna let you get into that situation. Um, I, I put this one in here almost a little bit um, as, a, uh, as a joke, but not totally. Uh, there are a, a thousand moving pieces to a, uh, a transaction. So um, I, I throw this one in here um in the in a perfect world you don't even know that you know 90 percent of this is going on in the background um we just want you uh, i just put it in there as a as a sort of show and there's even more than this this thing could go on for a long time but just a lot of moving pieces um definitely don't don't get overwhelmed that's what our job is as lenders or real estate agents jobs um, are as realtors um, is to help guide you through all of this uh, this process. And that's everything I wanted to say. So I will see if there's any other uh, questions that have been brewing. I'm trying to think if I missed anything I wanted to get in there. I don't think so. I think I'm all set. Fantastic. That was a really comprehensive view of a really complicated process distilled down in layman's terms. And we really appreciate that. So thank you, Sean. Uh, our audience, do we have any more questions? Uh, we also want to make sure that you have Sean's contact information for after tonight's program. If you do have other questions that occur, he and anyone at Director's Mortgage would be happy to help answer any of those. We uh, don't have any more questions that have come through right now. So I just want to let everyone know, of course, we are the library. We have a lot of information and a lot of resources available to you at uh, DeschutesLibrary.org on this topic and all other topics involved in buying your first home. Uh, so please come check us out. Uh, we are here to help. We also have librarians and staff on hand. If you have specific questions and you can't get a hold of Sean or someone quickly, uh, we'll ask one of us, we might have an answer for you. All right, Sean, I'm gonna let you go for the evening. Yeah, thank thank you. you again so much. Thank you everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, please check out DeschutesLibrary.org for all of our other great fun free programs. And we hope to see you next time. Oh, Thanks good. everyone. Thanks.